the party was full of people. Scattered throughout the large suburban mansion were 20 and 30-somethings dressed in elaborate casual attire that was meant to look good, but not seem like they were trying to impress. They were playing pool or ping-pong, watching television, eating and drinking, dancing and laughing, and everyone seemed to be having unbridled fun. A tall, thin man with dark curly hair and a handsome, open face stood in the corner of the main room and nervously looked over his shoulder at an aggressively tipsy, red-headed girl who was making it clear that she was ready for any kind of fun at the party or afterward. But the man only continued to nod absent-mindedly, obviously trying to disengage himself from a conversation that at another time he might have started on his own. The last words of an inaudible question reached his mind, and he realized he had to answer. So this is a date then? He looked at the redhead with a somewhat panicked look. Uh, yeah, sure. Can we take your car? I, uh, probably shouldn't drive. He continued to search the room over her shoulder. Hey, listen, I don't mean to be rude, but I really need to find Jason. I was wondering if you could, uh, text me what you want to do and I'll catch up with you later. A look of surprise appeared on the red-haired girl's face. Jason? Jason Bright? He came to the party? I thought he became a monk or something. Yeah. I, uh, talked him into coming. And now I can't find him, so I really need... At that moment, a pretty blonde woman with curly hair walked by, and the man suddenly jerked slightly in her direction. Hey! Hey, Kara! Hey, Kara! The blonde turned and a wide smile lit up her face. She nodded at the beer in his hand and raised her eyebrows expectantly. Hey, Brian, did you bring one of those beers for me? He threw her an incredulous look as if he didn't realize what she'd said and then abruptly dropped his own question. Hey, where's Jason? I went to get a beer and I haven't been able to find him since. The blonde's smile faded and she gestured to a room off to the side. He was in the entertainment room about 15 minutes ago. You can check in there. She smiled again. Why, is he your beau or something? Brian gave her an appraising look and gave a short snort of laughter. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Kara? Well, no such luck. It just took me forever to convince him to come have fun, so I'm a little nervous about him having a good time. He turned to the redhead who seemed a little upset that her dominance over Brian had passed to the pretty blonde. Hey, listen, really, text me what you want to do. I need to find Jason, okay? The redhead pouted her lips and nodded her head with muted enthusiasm. Okay, I'll see you after. But Brian left before she finished, aggressively pushing his way through the crowd toward the entertainment room, where he found a dozen or so people slouched on a couch sitting Indian-style on the floor, or sprawled around while a music video played on the big-screen TV that took up the entire room. He took a quick look around, then caught the eye of a jolly fat man who was swaying awkwardly to the beat of the music, holding a drink in one hand and potato chips in the other. Hey, bud, have you seen Jason? Jason? Yeah. Jason Bright? He was here a couple minutes ago. Oh, yeah, man. I'm pretty sure he left. Got up all of a sudden and jumped out of here like he was throwing up or something. Walked out of the room? No, man. Right out the front door. Brian stood for a minute, shaking his head slowly, trying to comprehend what the fat man had said. What? Why? What the hell happened? I don't know. When the game was over, we changed the channel to some movie and watched it for a couple of minutes, and then he just got up and left. A movie? What movie? Oh, you know, an old one with Dustin Hoffman. The Graduate. But we hardly watched it because it was at the very end when we turned on the TV. At the end? Yeah. You know, that whole wedding scene when Hoffman comes in and hits the glass and the girl runs off with him. Brian's face began to redden starting with a faint pink hue and rapidly progressing until he looked like a tomato with human features. He then began to slowly throw words at the fat man, 
carefully enunciating them with increasing force and volume for maximum effect. You tuned into a movie where the bride leaves the groom for another man. Uh, at the goddamn altar, and Jason Bright sits back and watches. The first fucking time he's been out of his shabby little apartment in months? You're a bigger idiot than I can imagine. Next chapter. Jason Bright lay on his side, admiring his sleeping bride. She was breathing quietly and rhythmically, and each exhalation of air from her mouth gently ruffled the mop of straw blonde hair that fell across her face. To most observers, Penny Miller was a small, attractive woman, several pounds overweight, and with facial features too coarse to be considered classically beautiful. But here, in the rays of the morning sun, falling on her pure pale skin and giving it a certain radiant translucency, she seemed to Jason like an absolute angel, a gift of love from God himself. By all accounts, Bright had been extremely successful in life up to this point. He had done well in high school, excelling in sports and academics, graduating with top grades, and then earning near-perfect grades in a double major in finance and statistics before becoming an economics major at the Chicago Business School. After that, he easily landed a job with one of Chicago's top trading firms and moved steadily up the corporate ladder, getting more and more responsibility and more and more money. But he never felt like life was working out the way he wanted it to until he met Penny. And that was because despite all his success in business and sports, he'd never had anything resembling a satisfying romantic relationship. In high school, he'd been a nervous teenager around girls, overly anxious, completely clueless about how to approach them to talk to them, let alone start a relationship. He'd gained some confidence in college when a couple of aggressive girls saw him as a good guy and didn't let his insecurities get in the way, but it still only led to a string of superficial hookups that didn't lead to anything significant in Jason's opinion, and that pattern seemed to continue in business school and for a few years at his new job. But then he met Penny, and everything changed. She was easy to be with, lively, talkative, attractive, without pretense or vanity. She wanted quiet, peaceful evenings, a house with a fence and kids, and Jason wanted her. And so, with a sense of comfortable inevitability, their relationship smoothly developed and strengthened, so that eventually, practicality demanded they move in together. And so, on a warm summer evening in a small park by the lake, Jason got down on one knee and with trembling hands held out the ring to Penny, who accepted it with tears, a smile, and an enthusiastic hug. In the eight months since, plans had been made, invitations sent out, dresses chosen, and a church reserved in Penny's hometown in southern Illinois for a date that was only six days away. Next chapter. They drove down the I-55 highway, listening to music and chatting, with Penny occasionally texting friends or family to update them on their progress towards Centerville or to make wedding arrangements. About half an hour into the drive, she quieted down a bit, and Jason watched her gaze wistfully at the scenery passing by. After a couple minutes, he decided to break the silence. Are you okay, sweetheart? Problems with the caterer or something else? She looked back at him with a slight expression of confused surprise, as if she'd been caught doing something inappropriate. Oh. Oh, no. No, it's just... I guess I was just thinking about getting home and all the ghosts and problems I left behind. Jason scowled an incredulous grimace in response. Ghosts? Problems? What are you talking about? Penny sighed melancholically and stared absent-mindedly out the window for a while before answering. Well, it's really not a big deal, Jace. But well, you know, some of my old friends and some of my family had a certain idea of who I should be with, and they're not. Be very supportive of the wedding and all that. That's about it. Wait, you mean your family doesn't like me? I thought we got along really well when they came to visit. Both times. I actually had a great time with your dad. Did I misunderstand something? Penny shook her head decisively. Oh no, no, not at all. My parents love you. They think you're wonderful. They really do. She paused, chewing on her lower lip for a moment before continuing. But, like I said, some old friends and relatives. 
Well, they still think that. Penny stopped and looked out the window before finishing her thought. Look, Penny, what's your point? You seem to think I should know what the problem is, but I really have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Penny let out an intermittent sigh. Look, Jace, this, this is about Kenny. Jason glanced at Penny, then shifted his gaze back to the road. What about him? I mean, it's been over between you two for about five years now, right? Why has it become an issue now? Unless you haven't told me anything. Penny shook her head, and then, paradoxically, nodded, her face showing a mixture of concern, confusion, and disappointment. No. Well, yeah. Sort of. Look, Jace, I told you everything that was important about me and Kenny. That we got really serious in high school, that we were going to get married, and that it just... It just didn't work out. Penny paused chewing her lip again, a look of uncertainty back on her face. Jason shrugged and raised his eyebrows in an expectant gesture before Penny continued again. To tell you the truth, a few of my friends seem to be very interested in our, uh, relationship. They thought about them. Still do. Like some kind of romantic fairy tale, and they keep pushing me to give Kenny another chance. They tell me that he's changed, that we're meant to be together, and... Stuff like that. Jason pressed his lips together in thoughtfulness and subconsciously added speed, quickly overtaking the car in the slow lane. So, what are you trying to tell me? That I have to compete with your ex a week before our wedding? Is that what you're saying? Penny clenched her hands in annoyance and pressed them to her eyes. No, no, it's not. That's not what I'm trying to tell you at all. She lowered her hands and looked at Jason seriously, waiting for him to take his eyes off the road and look at her before starting again. It's just some of them, a few friends, especially Teresa, might try to, I don't know, try to push us together or treat you badly or something. And I just wanted you to be prepared. That's all. Teresa? Isn't she one of your bridesmaids? You ask someone who doesn't doesn't want us to get married to be in the wedding party? Isn't that a little, uh, weird? Penny frowned. Well, I understand what you're saying. But Teresa was my best friend, and I feel, I don't know, obligated to be a bridesmaid. I mean, I was at her wedding, and it would be, uh, rude, I guess, if she wasn't one of mine. She turned to face Jason and glared at him, asking him to understand her, but he only stared at her dumbly, then turned away to the road for a few moments to calm down. Finally, after several minutes of silence, he let out a long sigh and turned to Penny again, displaying the most reassuring smile he was capable of. Listen, Penny, I'm in this for the long haul. If there are people who want to complicate things, I can live with that. As long as you're on my side. As long as we both have each other's backs, what could go wrong? After all, it's just you and me, and no one else can hurt us. Right? So, uh, so just stop worrying. I'll be on my best behavior, be as charming as I can, and bite my tongue when I have to. I'll do my best to make sure everyone in Centerville realizes that you made the right choice, and if I can't, so what? Their opinion means nothing in the end. All nervousness vanished from Penny's face, and she leaned against Jason's shoulder with a satisfied smile as he continued to drive. Next Chapter By the time they pulled into Penny's childhood home, a two-story farmhouse on the outskirts of Centerville, set in a quiet neighborhood with large, unfenced yards and dominated by old maples and oaks, it was almost dusk. They'd barely made it a few feet down the driveway when Penny's mother, an exuberant woman with graying hair and a pleasant face, squealed with delight, arms outstretched, approaching her daughter like a jiggling middle-aged rocket, seeking warmth from the front door. Oh, Penny, how is my beautiful girl doing? My blushing bride-to-be? She exclaimed, drawing her to her with soft hands and enveloping her in a mist of sweet perfume, kissing her cheek. She held her tightly against her for a few moments savoring the feel of her daughter in her arms, and then reluctantly released her to turn her attention to her future son-in-law. And how are you doing, Jason? 
I'm so happy to see you. You look so good. So handsome. She gave him a brief hug and then led them down the walkway to the door. Come on in. Daddy's waiting for you inside and dinner's almost ready. And we have a lot to talk about. Daddy was Penny's father, a quiet, serious man who rose from the couch as they entered the house to greet his daughter with a light hug and Jason with a firm handshake while Mom went into the kitchen to start spreading food on the table. After a few minutes of small talk, he led them to the table and, with a look of domestic authority, showed them where to sit, said a brief greeting, and nodded his head toward the food pork chops, salad, and a plate of mashed potatoes, a dinner for four that could feed ten. The conversation at dinner was almost exclusively about the wedding and was dominated by the women, who enthusiastically discussed seating arrangements, plans for dresses, photographers, music, and menus for the reception. When Penny mentioned that everyone should stand in the correct places during the ceremony, Mama Miller's face took on an expression of pained surprise, as if she had suddenly remembered some unpleasant detail that needed to be taken care of, and she turned to Jason. Jason, honey, when is your daddy coming? What night? Jason set his fork aside and finished swallowing his potatoes. I'm pretty sure he's flying into St. Louis Thursday afternoon, so he should be here by Thursday night for the rehearsal dinner. Mom's face suddenly darkened and looked like she was about to cry, and her voice took on a tinge of extreme distress. Oh! Oh, Jason, I'm so sorry. I... Oh, I was afraid of this. Oh, no. Oh, God. Her words grew softer and softer as she spoke until they became a faint whisper and then disappeared altogether. Jason looked at Penny for a clue as to how to respond, but she only shrugged. So he turned to Mama Miller again and tried to catch her gaze, furrowing his brow in sympathy. Look, whatever the problem is, I don't think it's going to be a big one. I'm sure it'll be fine. Just, just tell me what's wrong. The older woman shook her head and put a hand to her mouth to hide the wrinkle on her chin that always appeared before she cried and took a few moments to calm down before answering Jason. They told me last week that, that there was a mix-up and the country club wouldn't be open on Thursday. So? So I told them we could reschedule the rehearsal dinner for Wednesday. Clarice decided that would be fine too, made some calls and rescheduled the party for Thursday. Jason felt so relieved at the triviality of the problem that he even laughed out loud, then reached across the table to stroke her arm and began to comfort her. It's not a problem at all. My dad prefers to stay away from public gatherings, so he won't mind and I'm sure the photographer and the stewards will tell him where to stand or sit on Saturday. Really, it'll be fine. Penny's mom took a deep breath and let out a quiet sigh of relief. Are you sure, Jason? I don't want anyone to feel left out. Oh, I'm very sure. Very much so. He'll be fine. He gave her the most conciliatory, reassuring smile. But what kind of... What parties on Thursday are you talking about? I don't remember any party. He looked back and forth between Penny and her mom for clarification. Well, a bachelor and bachelorette party, of course. Isn't your best man? Your friend Brian, is he? Didn't he have a party plan? Oh, yes, I think he did. I told him to keep it low-key. Nothing flashy. I'm not a big drinker, and I wouldn't want to throw a big send-off. But even if I did, most of my friends won't show up until Saturday for the wedding so I didn't think it would be a bachelor party, just a little get-together. Jason absent-mindedly rubbed his chin and looked at Penny, then back at her mom. I hadn't thought about it, but I guess Penny's having a bachelorette party? Mom glared again. Oh, yes, Teresa's taking care of that, and she's really, really excited. I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun. Becky and Bob will be there, Susie and her husband, and of course Teresa and Tim and lots more, I understand. All your old high school friends want to see you. Jason smiled at Mrs. Miller's enthusiasm and shifted his gaze carelessly to Penny. She stared woodenly at her mother, her face an uncomfortable, stiff mask with a drawn smile, a weak attempt to hide that this new event was a problem for her. Jason felt something stirring inside him, something unsettling. Next chapter. 
The rehearsal dinner was just beginning, and Jason already felt like leaving. For two days, he'd felt like he'd been on display to Penny Miller's old friends, not particularly like the new ring she wore, subjected to admiring glances or squeals of delight and occasional relatively hidden looks of vague disapproval or even resentment. And this dinner promised only more of the same. The main problem was Teresa Southern, a tall, attractive woman with a somewhat regal, officious demeanor who sat upright at the table with her heavily tipsy husband, Tim, a thick, ruddy man with slicked back hair and lamb chops. Teresa, who'd led the cheerleading squad in high school and somehow managed to maintain her authority a decade later, was Penny's self-proclaimed best friend forever and seemed to steer the dinner conversation like a talent contest judge, determining which topics were appropriate and which jokes were funny. Jason had met Teresa the day after arriving in Centerville, and she had been an omnipresent irritant ever since, subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, manipulating wedding plans, dinners, and general entertainment, inviting or not inviting friends to this or that event, coaxing Penny to follow her ideas about appropriate attire, speech, and company. But the most annoying and disturbing event was when Teresa dragged Kenny, the high school football star, prom king, and Penny's former boyfriend into the social program, including dinner and a group movie the night before. Kenny was a gruff country boy with a square jaw, a smile full of bright white teeth, thick wheat-colored hair, and a murmuring, ingratiating voice. Jason had found him affable and chatty, and perhaps he might have been relatable if he hadn't been the central figure in Teresa's apparent desire to celebrate Penny's high school past without Jason. But now, Kenny was sitting next to Teresa, smiling broadly, shaking his head and giggling at every story resurrected from the group's collective history, and they all involved him and Penny, and it had become almost unbearable. So he chewed his chicken slowly as he listened to yet another story being retold in an almost feverish tone by the diminutive shawl sitting next to Teresa. The current flashback concerned a chapter of an old, apparently epic romance between Penny and Kenny. This time, the story of Kenny hiring a horse and baby carriage to take Penny to prom in style. Penny blushed, Kenny glowed with delight, and Jason felt a vague, growing sense of nausea threatening to send some of the rubberized chicken back into his plate. Oh, and Penny was wearing that old-fashioned hooped dress. Remember? She was just gorgeous. She fluttered and twirled on the dance floor like she'd just come off the set of Gone with the Wind. She paused, almost out of breath swallowing nervously, looking around the table, obviously making sure the group approved of the story before continuing, her voice even higher than before. And Kenny, he was wearing an old-style black tuxedo and a hat, and dancing this old waltz or something after they were announced king and queen. Teresa nodded toward Penny and gestured at her with her fork, smiling sentimentally. No one ever looked prettier or happier than you that night, girl. She looked back and forth between Penny and Kenny. You two were gorgeous. The other women at the table shouted in agreement. Penny blushed nervously, and Kenny glared, and for once he had nothing to add to the growing cacophony of voices describing the different perspectives on that particular dance on that particular prom night. By then, Jason was completely lost in his own thoughts, trying his best to disengage himself from the ongoing conversation, to maintain some sense of calm. He looked around the room, noticed Penny's parents at another table, and wished he'd sat with them instead of Penny's friends. For a moment, he noticed the decorations and wondered why Penny had chosen green and yellow, even though her favorite color was royal blue. But then he realized that those were the Centerville High School colors Teresa had chosen. Finally, he returned his gaze to the animated faces of the men and women at his table, suddenly experiencing an overwhelming sense of isolation, an outsider at his own party. I'm sorry, they may have gotten a little carried away. He barely heard the voice over the noise and his own detachment from the conversation. He turned to his right to meet his gaze with the speaker, a plump, freckled woman with brown curly hair, squinted eyes, and a crooked smile. Huh? What did you say? She nodded across the table toward Teresa. I'm sorry she kind of took over everything. It's just... Well... She knows everyone here so well, and they're all so close. I don't think she wanted to cut you out of everything. 
Jason felt the tension subside and smiled. Yeah, I understand that. I think I do. It's just a little hard to join her when I don't know any of the stories. And I guess I'm thinking about other things. The brunette continued to smile. Like about your upcoming wedding? Jason snorted with laughter. Yeah, like, well, my name is Betsy, Betsy Palmer. I don't know if you remember. Jason interrupted. Yes, yes, I met you yesterday. At the mall. I remember. They were still engaged in casual, introductory conversation for a few more minutes when, from across the table, Jason heard his name mentioned in some question. Looking around, he realized with slight bewilderment that Teresa was addressing him. I'm sorry, Teresa. What did you say there? I didn't hear you. Teresa smiled serenely at Jason. I asked, she began, emphasizing the word asked, with a tinge of annoyance at having to repeat the question. If you could tell the rest of us exactly what you do, it seemed a penny that you'd rather explain. Feeling the blood rush to his face from the unexpected attention, Jason began to stammer as he tried to explain. Well, I, uh, compile and manipulate economic models using a variety of new and advanced analytical techniques to help our firm make investment and marketing recommendations for our clients. Everyone stared at him with blank stares in response to his answer. Well, that's clear as mud, Kenny stated, half laughing. Jason looked at Penny, who smiled at him and nodded her head, encouraging him to continue explaining. He smiled back and, still a little embarrassed, tried again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's really not that complicated. I'm just mathematically evaluating the situation to help our clients and other companies and investment institutions to figure out what to do with their products or whether they should issue stock. And things like that. This explanation elicited murmurs, half-smiles, and nods, but the room was suddenly quiet, and Jason felt an urgent need to fill the air. He took a deep breath, pulled on his best fake smile, and turned in what he hoped was an interested voice to Kenny, who seemed more than surprised to hear Jason's question. So, uh, Kenny, Penny tells me you work at the Ford dealership we drove past when we came into town. Do you like the job? Is it a good job? Kenny raised his eyebrows, which gave away his suspiciousness, and began to answer in a quiet and slow voice, choosing his words carefully. Yeah, yeah, it's a good job. I think it is. It's a lot of work sometimes, but I... I like it. So you're in sales? Selling cars? Kenny's tone changed abruptly. His answer was harsh, tinged with anger and resentment. No, no, I'm not a salesman. He replied, emphasizing the word not through clenched teeth. I'm one of the managers. I'm not just in the business of selling cars, much more. There was an awkward, embarrassed silence, and Jason felt all eyes in the room on him, sensing that he had made a terrible social mistake, but not realizing what it was or what exactly to do about it. I'm sorry, I... I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sorry. He stuttered, opening his hands in a peace sign and smiling weakly. He was somewhat relieved when Kenny smiled back and muttered, It's okay. Next chapter. Pressed tightly together on the double bed in Penny's old bedroom, with moonlight streaming in through the open window and casting ill-defined, ghostly shadows, Penny and Jason lay in each other's arms, recounting the events of the evening and conducting a post-mortem of the rehearsal dinner. They both agreed that it had been more than they had realized. Too much food, too many people, too much noise, and too, too much tension. What was that cool asshole's reaction to being asked if he sells cars? He practically exploded in there. I wanted to melt in my chair, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Penny pressed her lips together in thoughtfulness and stared unseeingly at the ceiling, formulating a response. Kenny has some baggage, Jace. You have to realize that. It's not his fault he blew up. Not really. Jason rolled over onto his side and looked intently at Penny, his eyebrows furrowed in concern and frustration. He interrupted her with a harsh, business-like voice, from which the warmth had faded away, replaced by irritation and annoyance. Wait, are you saying this is my fault? Honestly, I don't understand what I did that was so bad. 
Seriously, I didn't realize he'd turn out to be so damn sensitive. I wasn't trying to make him look or feel bad or make a scene. I was just trying to make conversation by asking a completely frivolous question. Penny gave Jason a half smile and turned to face him, lifting a hand to stroke his cheek as she formulated a response. Jace, it's not your fault at all, kid. It's just that you have to understand Kenny, his insecurities. Come on, Penny. We all have insecurities, but we have to live with them. You can't just blow up every time someone says something that bothers you. He didn't really explode that much, she started to reply. Jason raised his eyebrows incredulously and had already opened his mouth to interrupt her, but Penny changed tact. Listen, here's the deal. Kenny's always been the big man on campus, the best athlete, the most popular guy, all that kind of stuff. But all of that ended after graduation. He didn't get the football scholarship he wanted, which meant he didn't get into college or get the job he wanted. Or the girl he wanted. Jason interrupted him sharply. Or the girl he wanted. Penny nodded in agreement, then smiled and leaned over to kiss Jason, her hand stroking his face in a reassuring gesture. Don't be mad about my friends, please. Jason wrinkled his nose slightly and smiled weakly. I'm not mad, really. I just feel like... I don't know, that you still have a connection with Kenny. I almost feel like I should. Penny raised her eyebrows. Like you owe what? I don't know. Compete for you or something. It's driving me crazy, I guess. Penny's facial expression turned incredulous, her mouth opening in surprise before she replied. Come on, you don't have to compete for me. I'm yours, you know that. Why do you get that impression? Jason pressed his lips together and furrowed his brows before giving a hesitant, confused answer. I don't know. I guess. I guess when Kenny showed up with that girl last night and tonight, I thought he was trying to make you jealous. And from the way you reacted, it looked like it worked. Like you were upset that he was paying attention to another girl or something. I know you were very serious, but it seems like, at least for Kenny, he never got over his feelings. Penny pressed her lips together in a thoughtful expression before replying, her speech deliberate, her words carefully chosen. Listen, Jason, you know that Kenny and I have been together for a long time, right? From when I was a freshman in high school until a couple years after I graduated? Jason nodded his head. Yeah, you told me that. Well, I told you we were thinking about getting married, and it's true. We did plan it. We had a honeymoon and everything. But after I graduated, Things fell apart a little bit. Kenny wasn't really interested in white-collar jobs. He just wanted to stay here and live the small-town life and do small-town things. And I wanted to go to college and get some kind of degree. We had a few disagreements, but eventually I left for college and he stayed here. We were still together. I'd come up on weekends. We'd spend holidays together. But he started getting jealous. Jason shrugged in acknowledgement. I know the feeling. Penny smiled and continued. He started coming to campus and kind of catching up with me at off hours. He said he was just trying to surprise me, but really he was testing me. In fact, a couple times I caught him blatantly spying on me. Anyway, it all ended one night in the library. I was in a study group and was going over essay questions with a guy when he put his hand on mine. Sort of flirting, but nothing much. Turns out Kenny was hiding behind some bookshelves. He came out and told the guy to get his hands off me. I was shocked and Kenny and I got into a huge fight right in the library. I ended up taking the ring off and throwing it at him. Told him not to hit on me again and to stay away. Ha, you never told me that before. Was that it then? Was it over at that point? Well, we talked on the phone and went out once or twice after that, but it wasn't the same. I moved on, met you, and here we are. She wrapped her arms around Jason and pulled him tightly to her, pressed her lips to his ear and whispered. And now it's just you and me here. Kenny's just an old friend. Okay, baby? Okay. Jason smiled and kissed her neck. He lay on his back and she used his chest as a pillow. And after a few minutes, he felt her rhythmic breathing on his chest as she fell asleep. And he was left lying sleepless, staring at the ceiling. Next chapter. 
John Raymond Bright was a stout man with a weathered face with a square jaw and salt and pepper colored hair cut into a bob. He sat between his son and Jason's best man, Brian Hewitt, a handsome and stout man with curly hair and a mischievous smile, at the only bar in Centerville that served food. It was a sports bar where rock and roll played loud enough to keep the conversation strained. Jason described the events of the week, including Kenny's temper tantrum during the rehearsal dinner and rubbed the stubble on his head with a meaty hand. God, what a freak, he said in a loud, gravelly, no-holds-barred voice, reaching for his beer. I mean, he sounds like a total freak. Brian laughed in agreement and took a bite out of his hamburger, and Jason just shrugged. Yeah, maybe, but anyway, Dad, you didn't miss much. I'm sure you'd find it pretty boring. Yeah, I guess so, said John, finishing his fries. You'd probably end up embarrassing yourself anyway, so it's okay. Jason started to object, but John stopped him with a raised hand. It's okay, Jace. We both know that this, he pointed to the bar scene surrounding them, is the best I can do. Jason sipped his beer and swirled it around in his mouth before swallowing. Yeah, I'm okay with that too, Dad. Better than last night anyway. John Bright looked at his son carefully then gestured toward the bar again. Is that all you wanted for your bachelor party? A couple hours in a sports bar eating hamburgers with that smiling fool and your old man? No dancing girls or anything? Jason shook his head vigorously. No, Dad, it's okay. It's just the way it is. And honestly, even if I wanted dancing girls or something, well, it's a small town and rumors would spread. I wouldn't want to start my marriage off on the wrong foot, you know? Yeah, I know. John nodded, taking a bite out of his hamburger. I know. The three men spent another hour at the bar, talking, joking, drinking beer, and watching the football game on the big screen TV behind the bar before the conversation dried up and they mutually decided to call it a night. In the parking lot, Jason waved goodbye to Brian and got behind the wheel of his car while his father grunted and moved into the passenger seat. Both men seemed immersed in their own thoughts as Jason drove the car out of the parking lot and down the highway to John's hotel. Neither spoke, both stared at the highway, both wearing masks of people who don't really see anything. After a few minutes, however, John began to fidget. He opened his mouth several times, cleared his throat, and glanced at Jason, showing all the typical signs of wanting to talk, but not really saying anything. Finally, a mile or two before the hotel, John officially broke the silence. Big day on Saturday, son. Big day. You ready? Jason cast a brief glance at his father, then shifted his eyes back to the road. I'm ready, Dad. Really ready. In fact, I can't wait to get married, to be a husband, to be a father. You're going to be a great son. Wonderful. John took his gaze away from his son and his voice softened and took on an awkward tone, precisely a mumble. Sure, sure, much better than I was. Jason quickly looked back at his father. Now, Dad. No, no, son. It's true. John raised his hand to interrupt Jason. We both know I've been a shitty father. We both know that. Hell, your mother and I split up when you were what? Three years old? And I barely saw you until... John paused for a moment, looking away and taking a couple deep breaths. No, you had a hard time, son, when your mom was in a car accident and you stayed with me. Really hard. In the darkness, Jason could make out his father bringing his right hand up to his eyes to wipe something away, then cleared his throat and swallowed hard a few times before starting again. So, I'm happy for you, son. Damn happy you have a girl you love. Happy that I can be here to see it. Jason nodded his head as he pulled into the hotel parking lot and stopped the car, then turned to look at his father. Dad, I'm glad you're here too. Really glad. You are my family. I couldn't have done it without you. John Bright turned to face his son, and for the first time in his life, Jason saw the tears on his father's cheeks and heard his rough, gravelly voice break as he spoke. Look, son. I just want you to know how sorry I am that after your mother died, you were left with a scoundrel like me. Hell, Jason, I could barely take care of myself, let alone an 11-year-old boy. 
John paused to wipe away his tears. But now they were streaming down his face, and his voice was higher and more ragged as he finished his thought. I... I want you to know how... how much I loved having you around, even if it didn't feel that way at first. How much I loved watching you play those games and go to school. God, you were such a hard worker, working part-time and still getting great grades. And the honors you got and the college scholarship you got. And then, uh, then you worked your ass off again, and then you found this great job. I just, I just want you to know that you deserve to marry a great girl, and that, that I'm damn proud of you, son. Damn proud. And now Jason was crying too, and both men sat in silence, each resting his right hand on the other's left shoulder, and looking at each other without a shadow of discomfort, until John finally opened the door and headed across the half-lit parking lot to his motel room. Next Chapter Teresa Jones's parents owned perhaps the largest house in Centerville, a huge Georgian mansion on several acres of land with half a dozen bedrooms, a recreation room, a library, and a huge living room. That evening, the living room had been taken over by a dozen young women who were now lounging on the sofa or sitting cross-legged on the floor, giggling, telling stories, drinking wine, and squealing with delight and embarrassment as the birthday girl opened her gifts. Penny, being the bride-to-be and the celebrant, was smiling just as wide and laughing just as loudly as everyone else present. Surrounded by a pile of gifts and lingerie, she was in her element and felt at ease and at ease with her old friends. But just at that moment, a drunken request to model some of the lingerie turned into a demanding shouting match that was picked up by all the women. Penny, blushing furiously and shaking her head, did her best to talk them out of it until she realized they weren't going to be refused. With embarrassed hesitation, she took the donated linens and headed down the hall to the only bedroom on the main floor. She spread the outfits out on the bed and stroked her cheek thoughtfully, trying to decide which one would be the least humiliating, finally settling on the baby dollar that came with the see-through wrap, the most modest one possible. She took her time putting it on and examining herself from every angle in the floor-to-ceiling mirror before returning to the hallway to an anxious flock of noisy women who welcomed her back with the kind of shouts, hooting, and hollering that usually occurred in a strip club. Penny laughed nervously and, though embarrassed, tried to play her part properly, posing as attractively as possible in front of the rowdy women. Most of the women responded with laughter and applause, but Teresa, more than a little tipsy, began shouting for more. Show us another one, Penny. Show us another one. Not surprisingly, her request was picked up by the rest of the women, but this time Penny held firm and shook her head, trying her best to kindly refuse the women, who let out a disappointed groan as she eventually retreated down the hall to the bedroom. Just as Penny entered the bedroom, there was a knock on the front door, and then Teresa's laughter and squeals heralded the arrival of three men carrying conciliatory gifts of champagne and vodka, to appease the hostess for crashing the party. With minimal objections, Teresa led them into the room where the first two, Bill Jenkins, a short, pot-bellied man with a cherubic face and horn-rimmed glasses, and Tom Anders, a taller and leaner version of Bill, but with even less facial hair, walked to the back of the room to chat with their girlfriends. The third man was Kenny Bailey, who immediately asked Teresa where Penny was, quietly explaining that he had brought her a gift he wanted to give her before the wedding. When Teresa said that Penny was changing in the bedroom and would be out soon, Kenny immediately began organizing the entire group into a choir that would sing the school fight song for Penny when she returned. But upon returning to the bedroom, Penny heard additional noise as the men appeared and assumed it was just the women playing another game or telling some particularly crude joke. Her return to the family room was delayed by the nagging thought that she was being a stick in the mud, and she began discussing with herself whether she should give the girls what they wanted and model some rougher underwear. In the end, she decided to have some fun and go all the way, so she drank some strong wine and changed her clothes. She looked herself over in front of the mirror, worked out a few poses, drank some more wine, and then, as confidently as possible, walked out of the bedroom and started marching down the hall to the waiting women. She burst into the room with a giggle, posing seductively. To her disappointment, she noticed a complete lack of reaction from the audience. The women stood with surprised or even shocked faces, 
saying nothing, some of them just opening and closing their mouths, and some of them almost frantically pointing at something or someone at the edge of the room. And that someone was three men. Bill and Tom stood with their mouths open, Bill's glass slipping out of his hands and shattering on the floor, and Tom was nervously wiping sweat from his forehead. Kenny grinned like a Cheshire cat and nodded lustfully, then began a slow, rhythmic clapping of hands in appreciation. Penny turned and ran down the hallway to the bedroom. She lay on the bed, staring at the ceiling, for about half an hour until Teresa came in to gently persuade her to return to the party. By the time Penny returned to the living room, there were only a few girls left sitting around the coffee table, finishing the rest of their wine and talking quietly. Kenny was still there, half reclining on the couch with his usual mischievous grin. He waved at her, and she reluctantly made her way through the obstacle course of furniture and presents, groaning as she sat down next to him, covering her eyes with her hands and resting her elbows on her knees. God, that was so... so humiliating. I just can't believe it happened. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Kenny laughed encouragingly, patted her back and leaned over to whisper. If it's any consolation, I'll never forget it either. Honestly, I only wish I had a camera to capture this moment for posterity. Penny covered her face and looked at Kenny, throwing him a brief look of unrestrained disgust. But his smirk turned into an indignant grin, and she laughed and leaned back relaxedly on the back of the couch. Well, I should have known you had that attitude. She stated with mock indignation, playfully punching him on the shoulder. Seriously, someone should have warned me about you breaking into the party. I was terrified. In response, Kenny shrugged, laughed, and made a big open-armed gesture toward Penny and the other girls. Surprise is my secret weapon. Without it, look how many wonderful things I'd miss out on. The two exes and the remnants of the party told jokes and racy stories for an hour until the conversation became quiet and contemplative. Finally, Penny yawned and stretched before declaring that she wanted to go to bed and should go home, and Teresa hesitantly got up to get her keys in response. But Kenny laughed at Teresa's tentative attempts to get up and insisted on driving Penny home, to which Penny enthusiastically agreed. Teresa smiled and nodded, then sank awkwardly onto the couch, watching the two leave together with approval. Conversation during the ride home was light and casual, full of observations on the dating and marriage habits of their old friends and reminiscences of days and events of years past. Two blocks from Penny's house, Kenny pulled off the road and parked the car near the tall hedge that blocked it from the windows of the houses. What? What are we doing here? Penny's voice sounded suspicious. I... I have something for you, replied Kenny, unbuckling his seatbelt and turned to her, pulling her closer. Penny raised her hand to stop him and shook her head decisively. No, Kenny, no. I'm getting married in two days, and I'm not going to park here and whisper with you for old time's sake. It's just not. She stopped abruptly, noticing Kenny holding out a small wooden box with stains and slightly rusted hinges, offering it as a gift. What? What's this? she asked. Open it. Kenny's voice was soft but insistent. Please. She reached out and carefully opened the box, looking at the contents in the dim light of the car with surprise. This is... Wait. This can't be. She muttered, slowly, reverently pulling out an opal pendant suspended on a thin gold chain, and her face colored with surprise and joy. How? How? I dived for it many times but could never find it. Then I ordered the pond drained and searched for it in the mud until I found it. When? Two years ago. In the summer. Penny began awkwardly working the clasp, trembling fingers careful not to damage the fragile metal. Opening it, she held the necklace out in front of her, admiring it fondly in the dim light. Why? Why have you waited until now? Her voice was so distant breathy, like a little girl seeing magic for the first time. I had this, this crazy idea that somehow we'd see each other and maybe, I don't know, maybe get back together. So I was saving it, saving it for that moment. But, well, you got engaged, and that put an end to those plans. 
so I figured I could give it to you now before you got married. Penny lifted the chain around her neck and tried to fasten the clasp. Kenny leaned closer, his cheek almost touching her cheek, and reached behind her shoulders. Here. He took the clasp and gathered it up, then placed it on her neck, patting it gently. There you are. Thank you. She breathed heavily, holding the pendant with her right hand as if it held life itself. I love you. I've always loved you. I love you. She instinctively jerked back with a hand on each of Kenny's shoulders and shook her head with an expression of horror, pain, and regret on her face. I... I can't do this. It's okay, Penny, it's okay. She shook her head furiously and pulled away from him to huddle against the car door. No. No, it's not. I... I'm getting married, Kenny. I'm getting married in two days and I can't... can't do this. She reached behind her back, opened the door awkwardly, and tumbled out of the car, falling to the ground. She quickly got up, still shaking her head, and ran towards the house, disappearing into the darkness. Next chapter. Twelve hours later, Penny stood on a small stool in the middle of the living room, mute and motionless as a living statue, draped in a flowing white-on-white -white wedding dress, while her mother fussed around her, pulling up the sleeves, tucking the folds of fabric, making sure the dress fit perfectly. You certainly aren't saying much this morning, dear. Are you all right? Penny let out a loud, unsure sigh. Yes, Mommy, I'm fine. Mrs. Miller cast her daughter a long, hesitant, appraising look. You don't seem fine. Is everything okay with Jason? Eh? Penny looked down with an expression of sudden panic on her face. Of course he's okay. Why? Why would he be upset? Did he say something to you? Did he seem angry to you this morning? No. No, honey. It's just that you seem so... so quiet that I thought maybe you talked or something. I thought that maybe... uh... maybe he was upset that we... that your dad and I insisted that he sleep somewhere else the night before the wedding. I think it's a lot to ask. And maybe we shouldn't have done it, but we just think it's, uh, it's kind of wrong. But if it's a big problem, if it's causing problems, he can sleep here tonight, honey. Penny let out a long sigh, and her body relaxed as she absently rubbed the opal pendant she wore around her neck. No, Mom. He, he wouldn't mind. He wouldn't mind sleeping separately all week if that's what you wanted. Jason, Jason's a good guy. Respectful. Mrs. Miller grumbled some more, but continued to look at her daughter with a restrained gaze. What is it? What do you have there, honey? She asked, nodding her head toward Penny's neck. What? Asked Penny guiltily, abruptly letting go of the pendant as if it had suddenly become unbearably hot. This? This chain and stone? What is it? I've never seen it before, and now you're wearing it like it's a prized possession. Did Jason give it to you? Penny pressed her lips together, delaying her answer for a moment. Kenny. Kenny gave it to me. Mrs. Miller suddenly stopped fiddling with the dress and took a step back from Penny, resting her hands on her hips in disapproval. You're accepting gifts from old boyfriends now? From a woman who's getting married tomorrow? Her tone was stern, accusing, and Penny responded by mirroring her mother's gesture. Hands on hips, determined, serious face. It's different, mother. It's, she said, touching the stone. This is the pendant Kenny gave me for my 16th birthday. What, the one you dropped overboard while canoeing the day after you got it? That one? I thought it was lost forever. Penny smiled, a distant look coming to her eyes as she rolled the pendant over in her fingers. He, he found it for me. He drained the pond and found it. He gave it to me. Gave it back to me, last night, Mom. I think, uh, I think it's a wonderful gesture. Don't you? Mrs. Miller snorted. I think it's a gift from an old boyfriend who still cares for you. That's what I think. And I think you'd better be damn careful with that penny boy. Damn careful. He's a real charmer. A real charmer. And you have a good man you're marrying tomorrow. Don't bring an old flame into your marriage, honey. It's not a good thing. 
don't do it. Penny frowned and answered her mother in a sharper, slightly annoyed tone. Why do you hate Kenny so much, Mom? You've always treated him down, like he was never good enough for me. Everyone around here loves him except you. Why is that? Mrs. Miller stepped toward her daughter and gently took her left hand with both of her own. Oh, honey, I like Kenny. I like him a lot. And, and I wouldn't mind you being with him if that's what you really wanted. All I want is your happiness, honey, that's all. And if you wanted to marry Kenny, that would be fine. But, uh, but I have to say I've always been worried about him. Worried that he didn't have the same goals in life that you do. He's a charmer, like I said. A boy who can create a great romantic scene for a night or a moment. But he doesn't have the ambition to do the day-to-day -day work of making a comfortable life for his family. Penny frowned. Is that why you marry someone, Mom? If he can make you comfortable? Is that why you married Daddy? Mrs. Miller smiled. No, honey. I married your father because I love him, and he loves me. But one of the reasons I love him is because he takes care of me every day. He works hard for me and gives me the life I want. If Kenny was what you wanted, him and the life he would provide for you, then everything would be fine, just fine. But I have to say I'm glad you have Jason. He's a good man who will take care of you. He'll make you happy for a long time. Penny nodded and shrugged. I know that, Mom. He's a wonderful man and I love him. It's just... It's just that I guess I've always had feelings for Kenny and... Well, being at home with him right now, it's kind of freaking me out. You know? It's hard to completely bury an old relationship. Mrs. Miller looked at Penny with sympathy and concern. I understand, baby, I do. But you need to get your head in order. You're getting married tomorrow, dear. You're marrying a fine young man who deserves the very best. Remember that. Penny nodded absent-mindedly in agreement as she continued to fiddle longingly with the pendant in her fingers. End of Part 1 Part the 2nd of May be coming out in 12 hours. Write in the comments if you're waiting for it. Also, give a like under this video and subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoyed this video.